the concept of Stellar was we were looking at you know how people on set and in television studios and in lots of different places were you know controlling their fixtures and a lot of times a lighting console might be a little bit overkill or it might be uh, you know too much you know you need to have a, a person operate it you know if you're on location it becomes very difficult. Uh, Cellar was never meant to replace lighting consoles but it was made for those situations where um, you really need to have a very easy intuitive way of controlling the fixture. There was also things that always bothered us about DMX for example where you know so many people spend a lot of time really creating the DMX network you know setting addresses and running um, you know setting the DMX mode and then you have a limitation that you have to be stuck in that DMX mode and you know we felt like there could be a better way through software that we could do all of this stuff automatically because it really gives you no benefit if you have the most perfect DMX network set up, everything's addressed perfectly, you spent a day doing all this, that's time that you could be spent doing something else. So the point of Stellar really is that it takes care of all of that for you. It will address all of the fixtures, it will automatically discover them, it'll handle the DMX modes, so that within about 30 seconds from opening the app, you could be controlling the fixtures and all you had to do was connect them with uh, you know, either Skylink or DMX cable or Ethernet cable. So just set up your basic wired network or wireless network and you could be controlling them and the app will do all of the hard work in the background so that you could just focus on sending the light for the scene, selecting the colors that you want in whatever mode that you want. So we have these beautiful graphic interfaces that are, you know, uh, very different from what people might be used to. A lot of people are used to these sliders, these faders that go up and down, and it's difficult to figure out which sliders for which thing, and is that what slider, what fixture is that attached to? And so instead of uh, worrying about that, we abstracted all of that stuff in the background, and now you can just tap on a fixture and start controlling it in a very intuitive, logical way for the way that the workflow uh, is on a set. So whether it's selecting a color temperature, or a gel, or an eight, uh, hue and saturation, or as we were talking about before, an XY mode, uh, we have these really nice graphic interfaces that make it very intuitive. Um, and even with the XY mode, some people might be confused about it, but you really don't have to be a color scientist to understand it, especially with Stellar. You see it graphically laid out. Uh, you could enter in the X and the Y value right on there, or you could just move your finger around the screen and do it that way. So it kind of uh, opens up some of these modes that might have been confusing or abstracted before and really presents them in a way that's very uh, useful to the user and, and allows them to adjust things very quickly can only use it with the L series and the sky panel and you know the reason of course uh, what that we did that was because of course we could have this very seamless integration between the app and our products because we could control both we have a hundred percent control over our our fixtures and then we would have hundred percent control obviously of developing the app so we knew that we could se seamlessly integrate these two and have the best user experience we also understand uh, that obviously that people are not only using airy fixtures on a set, right? So there's lots of different fixtures that they're using. So it has been a thought about how would we maybe integrate third-party fixtures in the future, and that's something that we're thinking about, um, and we're gonna try to figure out the best way to do that. But for us, again, we wouldn't do it unless we can have this seamless user experience, this seamless integration of someone else's fixture and the app, because for us, it's not just about trying to uh, tack it on there or throw on these other brands. It would really about, be about how does that fixture work and how can that uh, user interface look and uh, how would a user want to use that particular type of fixture. You know, those fixtures probably would need to be RDM compliant because that's what we're using to do that uh, communication. But over time, we're going to add a lot of features to the app so that it really becomes a full platform that people can rely on. We chose subscription for a few reasons. Uh, one of the things that was really important for us was to continue to build the app and develop it over time. And so if you have a, a one-time purchase, you know, with an app, it, it's, uh, you want to have a, a reasonable price for it. And if we had a one-time purchase, it would have been difficult for us to kind of continue to reinvest uh, in the app because you would uh, purchase it once and then you would get free updates of course if we just had a, a one-time buy model. So with the subscription um, we make that commitment 
uh, to the people who are subscribing that we will continue to develop it over time. We didn't want to just throw it out there and just leave it. We really wanted to, we had so many ideas for so many cool features that we could integrate into it in the future that we really found that the subscription model is really the only way to go. First, you could choose uh, how much you want to pay up front, right? So you could buy the, uh, the year version, which is more money, $99.99. Or if you didn't want to spend a lot of money, you could buy the monthly version, and maybe you only want to use it for two months, and then you could cancel your subscription, and then you've only spent $20, and then you could buy it again, the subscription when you want to do your next film shoot. So it gives a little bit of financial flexibility there on the um, side of the customer, and it also gives us um, some cash flow that allows us to kind of reinvest in the product. Uh, I don't think that Apple is going to integrate Lumen Radio anytime soon, um, despite our wishes. But so we have to rely on Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. So um, we chose Wi-Fi because it has a much uh, longer distance for for Skylink. It is fairly reliable uh, most of the time, you know. But if you're in an area that has a lot of interference or a lot of um, congested uh, network traffic, that's where you're going to see the issues. But the Skylink is also brilliantly designed in that we can use Wi-Fi to go from the tablet to the base station and then Lumen Radio, uh, CRMX, to go to the fixtures wirelessly. So you could have a complete wireless solution. But also, if you were having problems with the Wi-Fi portion, you could go Ethernet from your tablet into the base station and then still go that wireless component, CRMX, from the base station to your fixtures. So you have versatility built in there depending on how your, what your setup is. And then again, that was a part of our philosophy of building in versatility. We wanted to make sure that was there also as, as sets are becoming extremely congested with wireless signals from you know, wireless video and, and follow focuses and now uh, CRMX and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and all of these different protocols are all kind of colliding. It's going to be an interesting challenge to solve in the future for, for wireless on set. Um, but again, we think we've, we've uh, uh, engineered versatility into the Skylink base station so that people could kind of connect to it in any way that they want. So yeah, I'm not sad that we didn't integrate Wi-Fi directly into the product because um, it's really not a professional solution to be putting directly into the fixture from our point of view. You know, one of the interesting things since we launched the Sky Panel that uh, I wasn't expecting was we, we've been talking a lot more to uh, console operators, to programmers, um, which we really didn't have a huge connection to them before. You know, we knew a, a good handful of them, but now we've, we're really talking to them and we get really great feedback from them because these are the guys that are using it every day. Um, they see any uh, downside to uh, the product and we were able to get that feedback from them directly very quickly and we tried to react as quickly as we can. We really try to listen to not only the big guys but also the small guys because certainly there's a lot of production now that are smaller productions that don't have you know a hundred million dollar budget or whatever it might be they might not even have a million dollar budget um, and we try to listen to those people as well so you know you could see a lot of the features that we have are are geared towards them as well for example lighting effects you know if you have a professional lighting console operator you don't necessarily need to have the onboard lighting effects but if you're a smaller budget film that doesn't have a console operator uh, being able to just plop the uh, a sky panel on a light stand and have a cop car effect is huge. It saves you a lot of time and, and gives you really great results. Um, and then to answer your question specifically, we actually do have a DMX protocol that is just three channels. So you need to, yeah, so we have, uh, you're able to go back and select all of the previous DMX version protocols in the sky panel. So the first protocol was uh, version 3.4, which uh, followed the, the L series. And inside that DMX protocol, there are several DMX modes that are three channel. For example, the CCT mode and the HSI mode are you know, just three channels, uh, intensity, CCT, and green magenta, and then uh, intensity, hue, and saturation. So if you change the DMX version uh, to 3.4, you can then also uh, change the DMX mode to, to the ones that only have three channels. Mm -hmm.